Now, I don't know if you can see the whiteboard or not. Welcome to Benora's Bible study. And when I get in front of it, you may be able to see part of this. We're continuing on with our study on the two laws. And if I got out of the way, you could see there's quite a few scriptures here. I may try to take a picture of that afterwards. But this uh, two-law study that comes from Benora's authorized version of um, Benora's authorized version 1611, it's a blog site, and we continue on from that which was published regarding how the law operates in our lives and our relationship to it. What we must understand is that we are, scripturally speaking, dead to the law, freed from its horrible grasp upon sinners in order to establish it as a standard bearer and a definer of what sin is so that the righteousness like the law can be formed within us from a source other than stone. And I'm sure you'll pardon me if I sit down. I've had quite a long day with my van malfunctioning again and found out that I have a radiator problem and so I'm kind of and I did a practice run on this before you can see there's many scriptures here we're going to cover <clears throat> it helps me to to possibly uh, sit down and uh, maybe position the camera like this that's better I don't have to hold the camera but let's get into the scriptures as soon as we can. This righteousness comes rather from the spirit of the living Elohim. That is the one who helps us to follow the way. According to 1 John 3 and 4 in the King James, that whosoever committeth sin transgresses so that we see that everyone breaks the law. In fact, according to Scripture, whoever commits sin transgresses also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. The question arises, what law? Does it identify itself? Yes, it does, by Scripture. Romans 7, 7. What shall we say then? Is the law sin? Nay, I had not known sin, but by the law. For I had not known lust except... For I wouldn't have known coveting except the law had said you shall not covet. Obviously the law which defines sin is the Ten Commandment moral law of Yahweh, which is eternal. If we go to Psalms 119 to the Lamed section, Forever, O Yahweh, thy word is settled in heaven. Otherwise we can try a few other translations. That was from the King James, the New Living Translation, your eternal word, O Lord, all caps, stands firm in heaven. English Standard Version, your righteousness is righteous forever and your law is true. The New American Standard, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your law is truth. King James, thy righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and thy law is the truth. Holman Christian Standard, your righteousness is an everlasting righteousness and your instruction is true. The International Standard Version, your righteousness is an eternal righteousness. Your instruction is true. In 1 Chronicles 16, 17, he confirmed it to Jacob as a decree to Israel. Now even the infamous NIV states, your law is eternal. He confirmed it to Jacob in the form of an ordinance an eternal covenant to Israel. He confirmed it as a law for Jacob, as an everlasting promise to Israel. He has a couple of different ways of saying it. Now, while Moses' regulatory law only lasted from the time that the Israelites first broke the Ten Commandments upon the mountain unto her redemption at Calvary, so it's a temporal law, the Ten Commandment law is eternal because its moral precepts are perfect. Psalms 19.7 Yahweh's law is perfect, restoring the soul, refreshing the soul. The King James But whoso looks into the perfect law of liberty and continueth therein, he being not a forgetful hearer, 
but a doer of the work, this man shall be blessed in his deed. Now, I didn't put an attribution down there, but that should be James, the book of James. Returning to Romans, do we then make void the eternal law of Yahweh? Do we then nullify the law by faith? Not at all, yea, we establish the law. The restored name states in Romans chapter 8, 3, and, and the above was just a review, for what the law could not do and that it was weak through the flesh, Yahweh sending his own son in the likeness of sinful flesh and for sin condemned the flesh, sin in the flesh, that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. How does this righteousness make itself known? By works. In Ephesians 2, 8, for by unmerited favor are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of Yahweh, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Messiah Yeshua, unto good works, but Yahweh hath, which Yahweh hath, before ordained that we should walk in them. So then it is not a faith which annuls good works, but rather a dynamic faith producing good works, which mirrors the righteous deeds of the law. So then I find it a matter of emphasis. The good works religion teaches that unregenerate man, if he simply does enough good works, God will overlook both the law and sin and receive him. This is antithetical to scriptural gospel teachings. The truth is we can never do enough good works to merit the favor of Yahweh because the law is constructed in such a way it's foolproof, it does not allow for violation. In James 2.10, for whoso or whoever keeps the law but yet fails in one point, he is guilty of breaking it all. We can only receive <clears throat> unmerited favor through faith in the Messiah alone and what he did for us and that he died as a substitute. Very much in the same way lambs were slain under the old covenant as a substitute. Yet Yeshua was manifest to take away our sins and provide unmerited favor. It is imputed unto us for righteousness. It's not what we do for Yahweh. The emphasis is on what he did for us in saving us from our sins. In Hebrews 10, 9, Then said he, Lo, I come to do thy will, O Yahweh. He taketh away the first, that is, the first covenant, that he may establish the second by the which will we are set apart through the offering of the body of Yahushua, Messiah, once and for all. And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering oft times the same sacrifices which can never take away sins. I'd like to point out the best it did back in the old covenant was to cover their sins until the Lamb could come and take them away. But this man, referring to Yeshua, after that he had offered one sacrifice, atonement, is a preferred word for sins forever set down on the right hand of Yahweh, from henceforth expecting until his enemies be made footstool. For by one offering, as noted above, he hath perfected forever them that are set apart, whereof the set apart spirit also is a witness to us. And after that, he had said before, this is my covenant that I will make with them after those days, saith Yahweh, now notice the difference between the two covenants. One is stone. This is a different covenant. I will put my laws into their hearts, and in their minds will I write them. So we see that the old covenant came to an end so that this new covenant could be established, that we might be under faith, we might receive better promises and better assurances than the old. In fact, Hebrews teaches that there must be a change of the law and we will deal with that at some length. And it specifies what change? A change in the priesthood from Levi to Melchizedek. And that change of covenants then involves transferring righteous principles from stone, the Ten Commandment law, to hearts of flesh, not changing one jot or tittle of the meaning and the principles of that law in the transfer process. Furthermore, Yahweh found fault with the first covenant we see in Scripture because he found fault with them. Hebrews 8, 6, But now he's obtained a more excellent ministry insomuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant. 
which was established on better promises in Hebrews 7.12. For the priesthood being changed of necessity, there's also a change of the law. Notice the wording there. Uh, many people read that to read in the law. There's some change in the law. So what is this change? Uh, stated above or implied when the law changes addresses from stone to fleshly tablets of the heart. The change is complete. And then we must add to that change of address card from Levi to Melchizedek as noted in Hebrews 7.12, the priesthood has changed. Levi was fired from administrating the law. The priesthood went to Hamashiach alone. So if we compare this with what we learned in the cloister church circles, even using their scriptures in Galatians 2.16, knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by the faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ, not by the works of the law, but by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. The scripture plainly says it, Philippians 3, 9. And being found in him, not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Now, according to online, imputed righteousness is definitely a firm Christian concept in theology that proposes that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to believers accordingly and is treated as if it is theirs through faith. Many Christians, it seems, are disillusioned by the hypocrisy found in church circles and so many of them are switching to a works-based religion. Often these law-keeping groups insist that we have to keep all the commandments in order to gain Yahweh's favor or even eternal life, that our salvation depends upon it, and that the commandments and thus keeping them is, and we can notice their terminology on their sites, still in force, as if Yahweh somehow ever enforces his will on people. And uh, as we examine these sites, we see it's the 613. It's, it's very obvious people are going back under the Mosaic Law. This is why we're studying this subject. They're not only going back under law, they've been under church law. Now they're going back under Mosaic Law, which is antithetical to New Testament teachings because there's been quite a controversy over this whole subject. It's often a curious mixture of faith and works, or of law, which insists that, that the Messiah's offering of himself somehow didn't quite do the job in removing our sins. Okay, let me stop and think about that for a moment. And that we must somehow add to the finished works by law-keeping, or good works, in order to ensure our standing before Yahweh, or even our salvation. That's rubbish. That's dumb. As the scripture uh, maintains, and I as a student well acquainted with them, I urge that we do not throw the baby out with the bathwater. In departing from the leaven found in Christianity, and there is leaven, 